Welcome to New Point Church. Everybody in the building, how are y'all doing today? Good. Everybody online, how are you doing? Yeah. Was... So I'm so glad you guys are here. Uh, if we haven't met, my name is Kyle McGinnity. I'm the pastor here at New Point Church, and I am pumped for church today. Um, and as I talked about last or on the announcements, that next week we have a huge celebration. We're going to be celebrating five years as a church. I remember back five years ago on April 5th, Sunday, April 5th, 2015. It was an Easter Sunday. And there were 14 of us who walked into a building across town, began to set up chairs for what we thought was going to be about 120 people that might show up to worship and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus at the the first church service of New Point Church. And little did we know, but by the time we started service, 219 people had showed up, about double what we had expected. And we had four people that day who gave their lives to Jesus Christ. And kind of the rest is history. We've seen over 130 people now, you see their lights on the life board over here, who have given their lives to Jesus and followed through in baptism. And, and we get to celebrate all of that next week as we get to hear stories of life change and life transformation and what God has been doing. And so that kind of leads us to what we're talking about today. By the way, next week, here's my encouragement, invite somebody. And in fact, if you're watching online still and you haven't made it back to the building, please come back to the building um, and, and worship and celebrate with us. We're going to have the celebration going on in both services at 930 and 11. But here's my challenge to you, that you get and you invite somebody this week to come join with you to hear what God is doing in our community. Can you do that? Pray about it. Invite somebody. Trust that God is already planting seeds in their life and that they need to hear about the hope that Jesus offers. And so that leads us to today that we're going to talk about remembering why New Point Church exists in the first place. How many of you all have a problem remembering things? Like, like things slip your mind. You could just ask my wife this question if, if, if Kyle has problems remembering things. And I, I forget stuff so quickly. She could be looking at me in the face and I'm looking at her, but I'm not thinking about what she's saying. And so she tells me something and I hear it, but I don't really remember it. And she'll ask me about it five minutes later. and It's already out of sight, out of mind, right? All right. Husbands, you can relate. Wives, please have some, uh, some grace for your husbands, okay? Because this does happen. Uh, it's not intentional and it's nothing personal, but we will work on it. But remembering is a problem that we all probably have to some extent. And today we're going to talk about don't forget to remember. Don't forget to remember. The scripture passage we're going to be looking at is from Luke chapter 4. And in this, this scripture, Luke chapter 4 and Luke chapter 5, Luke is, is, uh, he he was a personal um, companion of Jesus and he got to see the different things that Jesus was doing and he decided to record a historical, biographical account of the life of Jesus. And so we hear his personal eyewitness account of the things that Jesus said and did and the miracles that happened and the, the uh, and the, the things that happened during that time. And so, so Luke is recording these. Well, I want, I want you to know that, that over five years ago, that it was that Luke chapter 4 and Luke chapter 5, God spoke very clearly through those passages of Scripture into my heart and gave me a vision to plant a new work and a new church that was going to reach people who had not found hope in Jesus yet. And so we read one of those passages today in Luke chapter 4. Read along with me as Luke records what's happening in Jesus' life. Luke 4, 38 says, Jesus left the synagogue and he went to the home of Simon. Now Simon's mother-in-law, now this is Simon Peter, one of the close disciples of Jesus. Simon Peter, his mother-in-law, was suffering from a high fever and they asked Jesus to help her. And so he bent over her and he rebuked the fever and it left her. And she got up at once and began to wait on them. And at sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness. And laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people shouting, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them, and he would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Messiah. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. 
and the people were looking for him. And when, he came to where, when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving. But he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. Today, we're going to talk about remembering, because I think we're so quick to forget. And here's what I believe that we're quick to forget. I believe that we are quick to forget the why behind the what, the reason behind why we have a church and we have a ministry I think very quickly, very easily after you plant a church, we've only been five years old, but I think sometimes we forget why we're here in the first place. What's God's purpose and plan for this church? I think we see this in our personal lives. Some of you can feel and you understand what I'm talking about when I say that, that in, in the moments and the days and the weeks and the months after you receive Jesus as your Savior, you're excited you're exuberant, you're, you're elated that you have forgiveness of sin and new life and, and you can't wait to, to tell other people about the hope you found. But then over time, it's like you forget. You forget the impact it's had on your life and then you forget that there's people around you that also need the hope that you've got. And so we're quick to forget. Today, the challenge is that we don't forget. The challenge is that we remember Today And there's some, a few things I want to point out in these scriptures that God just really leapt off the page for me. He, he highlighted them for me. And the first thing is this, we need to remember the people. Remember the people. In, in that verse, in verse 40, look at this again as Luke records the situation. It says, at sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. So I picture this story now that, that Jesus has been ministering now for, for months, if not years by now. And because of the things he had been doing and saying, he'd been preaching about the, the good news of the kingdom of God and what God is doing to transform the world. And he was, was talking about the, the hope that he's going to give people. And he was, he was healing people from all the various ailments and casting out demons and setting people free. He was gathering crowds. And people were flocking to see him. And, and not only that, that, they chose to bring their friends and their family and people who were around them that were sick because they, they said, if Jesus can do that for somebody else, maybe he can do that for me or for my friend. And so they were bringing him. And it, we find him that Jesus is at, towards the end of the day and people are just flocking and bringing their, their friends and their family and their neighbors to Jesus to heal and I get this picture of Jesus and the way that Luke describes and records the story. He says that Jesus stopped, he looked at them, and he laid his hands on each one of them. See, Luke specifically chose these words, I think, with a purpose. Because he wants you to know that Jesus isn't just a savior for the masses. He is a savior for every individual person. Every person matters. You matter. You're not just some number. You're not just some, some name. You are a person that God created, that he loves, and that God wants to transform. And I think that when Jesus stopped and he placed his hands on each one of them, he was, he was implementing an identity into them that they matter. You need to understand that you matter. Not only that, though, what I want you to understand is that every person matters. We need to remember the people around us. They were bringing all kinds of people who were sick and who were even demon-possessed because they saw their hurt and their pain. They identified with it and they, they introduced them to the person who could help them. They remembered the people around. And the question I would ask is, do we remember the people around us? Do we see them? I want to give you some, some startling statistics from our community, from Kay County, from North Central Oklahoma, and even from our state that we need to understand and we need to remember because we are so quick to forget. So here's our community today. Let me just give you some stats. Drug addiction is a tremendous um, thing that has impacted our community. K County has often been, been called the meth mecca of Oklahoma. Now, what I mean by that is, is the drug of methamphetamine has, has been so prevalent in our community that it has been, become known in the entire state that this is a place where that drug is ravishing people and families in our entire society in Kay County. That's a tremendous problem and concern that people are addicted and they don't know how to get out and it's destroying their body and their mind. And it's just a cycle. 
Oklahoma is ranked number one in the nation among prescription drug abuse. Number one in the nation among prescription drug abuse. Drug addiction is a huge thing. Another thing that our community struggles with is is poverty. Just pure poverty. 18% of all people who live in Kay County live below the rate of poverty. If they don't have enough money to meet their needs or to pay their bills or even to buy enough food to put on the table, that they're, they're actually having to miss meals because they don't have enough. Uh, 26% of children, one in four in Kay County, live below the rate of poverty. One in four kids. You could ask teachers. These aren't new stats to them. They know that. They know their kids that are coming through their doors. 63% of kids in schools in Kay County qualify for free or reduced lunches because their families can't afford it. 63%. Poverty is a huge issue in our community. One of the things that we're trying to help out with is to help provide meals and food for the needs in our community. We've been partnering with an organization called Go Fresh. In the last couple of weekends, we've been giving out free milk to families. In the past few weekends, we've had around 500 cars and families come through, and we've been able to give free milk to. There's a huge need for help. This weekend and the next few weekends, it looks like we're going to be able to ramp up our giving to be able to partner with this company to be able to give out two truckloads of food and milk. So we're going to have a truckload of food, truckload of milk this Saturday that we're going to need help. And so if you're interested in helping, please come talk to me, talk to Cheyenne, talk to Cody, uh, talk to Becca, find somebody. But this Saturday from 9 to noon, we're going to be giving away and helping our community. And we do that because we want to introduce them to the God who loves them. We don't do it to show off. We don't do it to cause attention to our church. We do it to meet a physical need so we can introduce them to a person, Jesus, who can help them with their spiritual need. Come help us. Poverty is a huge issue. Another issue in our our county is teen pregnancy. Kay County has one of the highest teen pregnancy rates in the entire state. Here's an interesting stat. One in 10 children born in Kay County... If you pulled all the hospital records, one in 10 are born to a teenage mother. One in 10, 10%. We go on to talk about kids and parentless homes in Kay County. Parentless homes in in, in Oklahoma is a huge concern. There's 9,600, 9,600 children right now who are in the foster care system. Most of them who don't have a secure permanent home, they go from home to home, house to house, They don't have any kind of stability. And they're often wondering if anybody really even cares. Almost 10,000 kids in our state. 36% of children living in Oklahoma. 36% of children living in Oklahoma live in a single family or single parent home. 36%. They've either got mom or dad, but not both. Here's some interesting stats from our community, which we are actually higher. K County is higher than the state average. But we have 51% of children born in K County are born to single moms. 51%. So one in two kids are born to a family where the, the mom isn't married or doesn't have a father in the picture. And so the family in general in our community in K County is struggling, is struggling. And that leads to another stat. 63% of grandparents in Kay County are raising their grandkids. So I know we have some grandparents here or watching online, but, but 63% that you, you as grandparents are, are the primary caregivers for your grandchildren. 63% of grandparents are doing that. One final stat I want to look at, though, and this kind of draws attention to the hopelessness that people are feeling is suicide. The Oklahoma has a suicide rate that is 37% higher than the national average. 37% higher than the national average. The suicide is a tremendous issue. Hopelessness is a tremendous issue in our state. In fact, K County, our county, suicide is the number two leading cause of death in young people aged 15 to 32. In this season of COVID-19, I've personally heard stories and I know families who have struggled with 
the issues of depression high, at higher rates than normal. And we've seen kids and even teenagers take their lives because they just felt like there was no hope and there was no way to turn, nowhere to turn and nothing that they, they could do. And so they would take their life. And it leads us to ask the question, why are the statistics in our community the way that they are? What is going on? And here's what I believe. As I look at these stats, I believe that every single one of them are symptoms of a greater problem. So think about the common cold for a moment. We have symptoms of the common cold. You have sniffles and you have a cough and you have a sneeze and you have a fever or whatever. Those are symptoms of a virus, right? They're, they're symptoms of a, of a deeper issue going on. And I believe that everything that we're seeing in our community are symptoms of a greater problem, even a greater need. And here's what it is. I believe that they, these are symptoms of life without a relationship with Jesus. Let me just break it down for you. I believe that apart from Christ, marriages fail. Relationships and families are broken because of the hurt that happens and because of the conflict that happens and because there is no hope for relationships to receive reconciliation when they don't even know what reconciliation forgiveness looks like themselves. And so people apart from Christ and marriages and relationships are broken I believe that apart from Christ, people are seeking satisfaction in drugs and in alcohol and other kinds of addictions because they don't know where to turn. They're trying to medicate a problem that's there, that they're trying to treat the symptoms when they don't know the solution. And apart from Christ, there's a real struggle for hope, for help, for purpose, for validation, for fulfillment in life. And so people are seeking that in relationship after relationship after relationship and other things. And it leads our society to a place where they're crying out for help, but they don't know where to turn. We need to remember the people around us. It's very easy for us to get in our own little bubble, to, to go to work and go home, go to work and go home, go to church and go home, and we forget that there's people all around us who don't have the hope that we have. The reason we planted New Point Church is because God gave us a vision for the people all around us. When we planted New Point, we looked at the stats and the statistics in our community say that 80% of the population do not go to a church and most likely do not have a personal relationship with Jesus. 80%. That's four out of every five people that we encounter at the store, at work, in your neighborhood, just count five houses down and four out of those five, those families are most likely lost without hope. Count the people that, you're, you, that you work with. And 80% of them most likely don't have the hope that you have. That leads us in Ponca City, that's over 20,000 people without the hope that we have. In our K County, that's over 60,000 people without hope. Do you remember the people around you? Do you see them? Do you see them? God has given us a vision to remember the people, to see them the way that God sees them, to see them the way that Jesus sees them as individual people who are hurting and in need of finding hope in Jesus. Do you see them? Here's the second thing I want us to remember, though. Not only remember the, the, the people, but we've got to remember the mission. Look at this in, in verse 43. Remember the mission. Of this verse, Jesus is, is he kind of got cornered. So he, it, it appears like he's been healing people all night. And at the end of the night, he tries to find an alone place by himself because the next day he's probably going to move on to the next place that he's ministering. And he, he finds this alone place. Well, the people follow him and they find him there. And they, they surround him. They're like, Jesus, don't go. Stay here. You're doing so many good things. He'll continue to do, to, to do the healings and, and do what you're doing. Stay with us. And then Jesus answers them with an interesting thing. You would think that he would be like, okay, I'll do that. It's good. I'll do it. But he says something interesting. He says, verse 43, he says, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also, because that is why I was sent. See, Jesus knew his mission was a message on the move, that his message had to get out, that there were other cities and other towns and other territories that didn't have the hope that that city had now. 
And it was his mission to get the word out. That he wasn't just going to plant himself in one place, but he had to be on the move. I think for so many of us, we miss our mission. We have forgotten it. And we have planted ourselves in one place, in one situation. And we stick to ourselves and we forget the mission. Today, I'm calling us to remember the mission. Jesus says that his mission is to preach the good news. The word good news is, is we use a, a church term for it called gospel. Like we need to preach the gospel. Well, really just the, the word gospel is a, is a Christianity phrase for, for good news. For good news. There is good news to be found in Jesus. Man, just, just looking at all the media headlines today, how many of you would like to hear some good news for once, right? Like everybody, every place you look, every story you listen to is just full of bad news. But I want to tell you, that's nothing new. The world is full of bad news. And for whatever reason, it is the only thing that we're listening to and the only thing that we're pumping into our bodies. But I want to tell you, there is ultimate good news in the message of Jesus. That it trumps all the bad news that we are talking about. It overcomes it and it brings hope to the hopeless. It brings life to those who are dead. It brings encouragement to those who are depressed. It brings new life to people who think that they're dead and gone. We have good news. Here's the message of good news I want to tell you about. Many of you understand it. Many of you know it. But let us remind ourselves of the good news of God and the message of Jesus. Here's the reality of humanity. That our God who created everything that there is, He created humanity uniquely and specifically. So right now, where you sit, or if you're watching online, listen to these words. God made you. He created you uniquely, specifically. He knows everything about you. He knows, he knows what you look like, what you act like, your personality. He knows the color of your hair. He knows the number of hairs on your head. And for some of you, it's not very hard to know that number, right? But he knows that. But he he uniquely created you and He loves you. Some of you need to hear this word today. That some of you feel like and you think like that nobody cares about you. That nobody knows you. Nobody cares about you. I want to tell you that there's at least one and He's the God of the universe. He says that He created you and knit you together in your mother's womb. You are not an accident no matter what you've been told, and you are not even your mistakes. Your mistakes do not define you. The labels that other people have placed on you do not define you. That is not who you are. You are uniquely created for God and for His purposes, and He loves you, and He is pursuing you. You need to believe that today, no matter what you've heard, no matter what you've done, no matter how far you've run away from God, He loves you and He's pursuing you. God's pursuing you. But here's the problem. God created us and wants this relationship with us. But because of our own sin and rebellion, we've broken it. We've broken the relationship because God is holy. And because we sin and make mistakes and we go our own way and we knowingly choose to live our life apart from God and make decisions that aren't pleasing to Him, God calls that sin. And that sin breaks and fractures the relationship we have with our Heavenly Father. And it's broken. Every one of us are in that boat. Not only is our relationship with God, our Creator, broken, but we feel the consequences. This is where hopelessness sets in. This is where depression sets in. This is where relationships become broken because because we don't know where to turn. We don't know what to do. There's this broken heart. There's this broken hole inside of us, and we don't know what to fill it with. And so we fill it with addiction. We fill it with a substance. We fill it with a relationship. We fill it with, with something that can never satisfy and never bring hope. We're broken. But God loved us so much that he didn't leave us there. Here's God's plan. That he brought his son Jesus into the world 2,000 years ago to fix the problem and reunite the relationship that we have with our creator. And here's how he did that. Jesus Christ himself represented us perfectly. He came and lived the perfect life that we should have lived. He met every righteous requirement that we should have done and he never sinned, not once. And he represented humanity perfectly. He took your place. And not only that, but the penalty that you deserve to die, which which because of our sin, we earn a wage, we earn a penalty. It's not only a broken relationship with God, but it's death and separation in a real place for eternity called hell. Jesus paid that penalty of death for us. This is why Jesus, 2,000 years ago, voluntarily allowed himself to be arrested, beaten, flogged, hung on a cross, crucified, and killed. 
Jesus did that for us. So he lived the life we should have lived and then he died the death we deserve to die. He paid our penalty for our sin. But this Jesus that I talk about in this story wouldn't be good news if Jesus stayed dead. It would be dead news. You wouldn't even hear about it today because some man claimed that he could forgive your sin but he never rose from the dead. There's no hope in that. Here's where hope is found is this man, Jesus, who claimed to be the Son of God, the Savior of the world, he also predicted that he would walk out of the tomb on the third day, and he did it. And in that act of resurrection from the dead, he proved his power over your sin and my sin, his power over Satan and hell for all eternity, and his ability to give you forgiveness of sin and new life. This is the gospel message. And God's word consistently says that everybody who calls upon the name of the Lord can be saved. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter your bank account. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter about any of that in your past. God can redeem you and save you and forgive you. And that is good news. He is the only way. Jesus himself says these words in John 14, 6. He says, I am the way the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. You see, the problem is everybody thinks there's multiple ways to get life right, to make life full of joy and fulfillment, to find hope, to find satisfaction. There are multiple ways to please God and to find your way into eternal life. But the Savior himself says there's only one way. Every other street is a dead end. There's only one way. And he says the way to destruction is broad, but the way to salvation is narrow. There's one way, and it's through Jesus. If there was another way, the Savior of the world wouldn't have had to die on a cross. But there's no other way. And Jesus voluntarily laid down his life for you and for me. And today, you have a decision to make. Whether you're watching online or you're in the room, you need to remember the mission that we have, and this is Jesus. Now, the question I want to ask you is, have you understood and received the message of the mission yourself? I often tell an illustration to just explain the mission and explain the message that that we're all in an airplane 30,000 feet together. This illustration talks about how how we're we're on this plane, the pilot comes over the intercom and and, uh, he, he mentions the fact that both engines are dead, our plane is going to go down, we're going to crash, death is inevitable. He comes back over the intercom and says, hold, just one second, I've got a message for you. There's a parachute under your seat. There's a parachute under your seat that if you pull it out, and you put it on, and you jump out of the plane, and you pull the ripcord, you can be rescued. And so the question I want to ask you is, what would you do in that situation? Well, hopefully you'd put the parachute on. See, here's the problem. You can't just know the parachute's under the seat. You can't just know about the parachute, know all the details of how it's made and how it functions and what you do. At some point in your life, you're going to have to trust yourself to the one thing that can save you. You're going to have to strap it on. You're going to have to jump. You're going to have to pull the ripcord. And you're going to have to trust that it will save you. And this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about there's only one way to be saved. At some point in your life, you're going to have to receive Jesus as your own personal Lord and Savior and place your trust in that and that alone. And that is where hope is found. And nothing else. So the question is, have you received him? Have you placed your trust and your faith in Jesus for your salvation? Because it's offered to you today. Now I want to transform that from one, for one second for you to remember that not only do you receive this message personally, but now we have a mission to get the message out. Everybody needs to know there's a parachute. The problem is that 80% of the population don't know. They don't know. And you know, you've bailed the plane, you're jumped out, you've got it. But everybody else doesn't know. And it is our mission to share the word. In Romans chapter 10, Paul talks about this message and he talks about the people uh, that need to hear this message. Just for a moment, listen to what he says. My heart breaks for a moment when, when we listen to his words. He says, how can these people, how can they, how then can they call on the one that they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? Jesus is talking about the fact that how are they going to hear if we never tell them? And how are people going to tell them if we never send people out? Sometimes we just wait for people to come to us, right? Well, I want to tell you, four out of every five people aren't going to come to you. 
They aren't going to come to you. We've got to go to them. This is why we planted New Point Church. Because we see the people. We see the mission. And our mission is this, and I say this a lot. But we want to be a people. We want to reach people who are far from God. We want to reach people far from God and teach them how to follow Jesus step by step. This is, at its basic foundation, this is why New Point Church exists. I don't... I didn't plant New Point Church. We didn't plant New Point Church so we could minister to Christians, the 20% of the population who know Jesus. We minister or we plant a New Point Church to be a mission hub to reach the 80% who don't know Christ yet, who don't have the hope that we have, who are looking for solutions in every kind of substance and relationship out there that will only leave them high and dry, who are depressed and hopeless and think that the only way to feel better is to take a substance or to end their life. This is why we are here. May we never forget that. We have a mission. We have a mission. One final thing that we got to remember today. We got to remember our Savior. Remember our Savior. Here's what Jesus has done. And in a moment, through taking of the Lord's Supper, we get to remember Jesus personally, what He's done for me. And maybe today you're going to be reminded of how uh, of the hope and the encouragement and the salvation you found. And, and maybe today that's going to inspire you to let somebody else know. Remember the Savior. Look what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He, he retells the account of the final days of Jesus, the final evening of Jesus before his crucifixion. He, he's gathered his disciples into the upper room of, of a neighbor's house and they've gathered to partake of the Passover meal together and he begins to take this Passover meal, which, which is an age-old celebration to celebrate the freedom that God had, had given to the Israelites, how he rescued them from Egypt through Moses, through parting the Red Sea, through giving them freedom. And so the Jews, for the last hundred, several hundred years, celebrate this Passover meal of drinking wine and of eating unleavened bread in celebration to remember the rescue that he gave them. And so Jesus takes the elements of this Passover meal and then he begins to reinterpret them in light of what he's about to do as he dies on the cross. And listen to his words. Here's what Paul says about this message and about the mission and about the final days of Jesus. Verse 23. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. He says this twice. He says, do this in remembrance of me. And so Jesus is taking the elements that they're already using to to have this Passover meal. And he says, this bread in a few days, you're going to understand, represents my broken body. And this, this wine that you're about to drink, it represents the blood that's about to be spilt from my body. And from now on, when you eat this meal and drink this cup, do it in remembrance of what I've done for you. Today, 2,000 years later, we still celebrate and partake of the Lord's Supper or communion with the same kind of remembrance. This is why we do it. We partake of it in the very serious nature that it cost God a highly price to give us forgiveness of sin and new life. That He took away the penalty of our death and He gives us His life and He takes our sin upon Himself and gives us His forgiveness. This is the transaction that that Jesus gives us. And it was done through his broken body and through his spilt blood 2,000 years ago on the cross. And so today in a moment as we partake of the Lord's Supper together, we're going to remember that personally, what what Jesus has done for us. And so let me just explain that. We have some some individually packaged um, cups of juice and uh, and bread. In a moment, we're going to play some music and we're going to allow you to step out from where you are on your own Um, and and go back and partake of the Lord's Supper to eat the bread and to drink the juice in remembrance of God's forgiveness for us and of Jesus' death on the cross. 
Now, it's open to anybody. If you're a guest today or if you are, have been coming for a while, it doesn't matter if you're brand new or you've been coming, that it's open to anybody who wants to partake of the Lord's Supper. The, the Really, the one requirement is this, that, that you personally know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that you've received Him as your Lord and Savior. Because if not, and you partake of the Lord's Supper, it's nothing more than just a mid-morning snack. <laughs> but if you know the meaning of it, then it's an act of worship to proclaim Jesus' own forgiveness for you. And so today we're going to give you that opportunity. And so if you're not yet ready to partake of the Lord's Supper today, don't feel like you have to. You're not obligated. But in a moment, we're going to have that chance to do that. And so we're going to prepare our hearts and begin to get ready for that. And my hope is that it will inspire us to remember the people around us and to remember our mission when we remember our Savior. To remember the people, to remember the mission when we remember our Savior. There's one final thing, though, I want to talk to you about. There are some of you in the room, maybe you're watching online, that if you were to partake of the Lord's Supper today, it really wouldn't have that much meaning for you because you haven't received Jesus as your own personal Lord and Savior. You haven't taken the good news and made it your good news. You haven't put on the parachute and trusted your life to the only thing that can save you, and it's Jesus' death and resurrection. By that, you can be reunited and have a right relationship with your Heavenly Father, and you can be given eternal life forever. By that, you can be born again. By that, you can be indwelled by the Holy Spirit. By Jesus, you can be given hope and satisfaction and purpose in life. But it's only through Him. And so right now in this moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray, to receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. And so if you're in the room or you're watching online in just a moment, I'm going to pray and give you an opportunity to trust Him, to give your life to Him, so that in a moment when you partake of the Lord's Supper, it will have meaning for you. So I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment as we prepare our hearts. And I do this so you can focus on what you're doing. And we're going to pray and we're going to, we're going to talk to the living God who hears us. And so if you're in the room and you want to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, or if you're watching online, I'm going to say a simple prayer. And we're going to pray to God together to receive Jesus as your Savior. If you're ready to do that, don't wait. Let's pray right now together. Dear God, I believe that you created me. And I believe that you love me. Even though I have sin in my life, God, I believe you love me. God, I believe you sent Jesus for me. That he is the Savior of the world. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross and you rose again. Come into my life. Forgive me of all my sin. Make me new today. Give me hope. Adopt me into your family. I receive your eternal life now. Jesus, help me to live for you. Thank you for saving me. Amen. Amen. I want you to look up here for a moment. I'm so incredibly proud of you if you took that step today to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you prayed with me. There's really one next step that we want you to take is if you're in the room, there's a connect card in the seat back in front of you. You can fill out that connect card and on the back side of it, there's a box that you can check that says, today I prayed to receive Jesus and make him Lord of my life. You can drop that card in one of the offering boxes on the wall before you leave and we want to help you to know what your next steps are to follow up with you. If you're online, there'll be a digital connect card. You can click the link and fill it out and we'll follow up with you as well. And now's the time that we get to celebrate and remember Jesus. So we're going to do that right now. In just a moment, I'm going to pray and I'm going to release you to start partaking of the Lord's Supper on your own when you're ready, when you're ready, and then return back to your seats for a final time of worship. Lord Jesus, thank you for who you are. And right now in this moment, as we prepare our hearts for you, we turn our hearts and our attention to you. That we realize that you are the Savior of the world. That you, you paid our penalty and you, you paid our debt. That our slate has been wiped clean. That we have been washed and cleansed by your blood. 
And so Jesus, as we partake of the Lord's Supper today, and as we drink the juice, as we eat the bread, God, it represents you and it represents what you did. And we are eternally grateful. So we worship you and we remember you today. And as we do this, God, as we, as we take the Lord's Supper, as we, as we do this, help us, Lord, to remember our mission and to remember the people around us. We worship you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Feel free to partake of the Lord's Supper on your own. You'll be moving. Go ahead and step up from your seat and do that now and return back for our final time in worship.